February. It's the shortest month of the year, and with it come long, cold nights that are the astronomer's friend. Hopefully, you're enjoying the weather and having nice skies. I will tell you that as I'm recording this, it's currently 19 degrees Fahrenheit, so I hope that you're keeping nice and warm. In this episode, we'll explore the planets and let you know how to see them. We're adding a new feature to the monthly What's Up episodes, where we explore a feature on the moon. The nice thing is that the lunar features are visible every month, so hopefully this will give you even more to enjoy when you're observing. We'll also explore some of the best deep sky objects that are visible on February evenings. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and hit that subscribe button. If you're listening on audio, please leave us a nice review on your podcast platform. We really, really appreciate that. We also love getting your questions, suggestions, comments, and reviews. You can leave them in the comments, or you can always email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 973-404-0380. Please subscribe to our Facebook group. We post a lot of fun things there about astronomy, astronomy history, and people involved with astronomy. And we like to have it become a fun forum for our listeners and watchers. So the link to that is in the show notes as well. So please join the Facebook group. If you'd like to help support the Astro Guy podcast and YouTube channel, you can buy us a cup of coffee. The money is used to maintain and update the equipment that we use to create and publish this show. Again, the link is in the show notes. Thanks. Okay, let's get to the February skies. Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm not an expert. I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. In February, the best chance of spotting Mercury will be the morning of the 1st, when it will be low in the east before sunrise. You'll need an excellent horizon to spot magnitude minus 1 Mercury in the morning twilight glow in Capricorn. Binoculars or a telescope will help you spot it. The planet is nearly fully illuminated and spans almost 5 arc seconds in diameter. While this is not the best apparition of Mercury, spotting it will definitely be rewarding. Venus has been ruling the morning skies for the last several months, and now we see Venus appearing lower and lower each morning. On the 1st of February at 6 a.m., Venus will only be about 5 degrees above the southeastern horizon. It'll be shining brightly at magnitude minus 3.9 and will appear 85% illuminated, and its disk will span 12 arc seconds in diameter. On the morning of the 7th, the 9% illuminated waning crescent moon will appear about 7 degrees east-southeast of Venus. Binoculars will help you to spot the thin crescent moon low on the horizon. On the morning of the 22nd, Mars will appear half a degree east of Venus. You'll need binoculars to spot Mars, as it will be about 100 times fainter than Venus. By the end of February, Venus can be spotted low on the southeastern horizon in the morning twilight glow shining at magnitude minus 3.8, and sporting a gibbous phase about 91% illuminated and spanning 11 arc seconds in diameter. In March, Venus will move into conjunction with the Sun and will not be seen until it re-emerges in the evening skies later this summer. So get your Venus viewing in now before it leaves our skies for several months. Mars is visible on the 1st in the morning twilight very low in the southeast in Sagittarius. On the 1st, it will be shining at magnitude 1.35 and shows a disk only 4 arc seconds across. By month's end, it will still be in the twilight, now in Capricorn, and it will be glowing at magnitude 1.27. However, it will still be small at around 4.5 arc seconds in diameter. Mars will be rising a little earlier each day, making it better to see as the year goes on in the morning skies. Mars won't reach opposition until January of 2025, when it will be at its best for some time. Jupiter spends the entire month in the constellation Aries the Ram. 
As darkness falls on February 1st, Jupiter will be nearly on the meridian, about 62 degrees above the southern horizon. It will be shining brightly at magnitude minus 2.34 and spans just over 39 arc seconds in diameter. Each night, Jupiter presents its ever-changing face as it spins on its axis every 10 hours. In binoculars, you'll be able to see Jupiter appearing as a bright, bloated star, and you should be able to pick out the four Galilean moons with ease. In a telescope, you'll be able to see the equatorial bands along with many other features on the planet. On February 14th, the nearly six-day-old waxing crescent moon will be five degrees west of Jupiter, making for a beautiful sight in the sky that evening. By the end of February, Jupiter will be in the southwest skies as the sun sets, having dimmed slightly to magnitude minus 2.18, and its disk will have shrunk to just under 37 arc seconds. In April, Jupiter will move behind the sun, so get your Jupiter views in now while it's still high in the evening skies. As darkness falls on February 1st, Saturn appears low in the southwest, in the constellation Aquarius. Glowing at first magnitude, binoculars will help you to pick it out of the twilight glow. You can still spot it in a telescope and view the glorious rings. The planet with its majestic rings appears about 36 arc seconds in diameter. But by the middle of February, Saturn will get lost in the glow of the sun until it returns to the morning skies in late April. So get your Saturn views in now. Uranus is on the meridian as darkness falls on the 1st. It's glowing faintly at magnitude 5.77, and you can spot it 11 degrees east and 4 degrees north of Jupiter, or about halfway between Jupiter and the Pleiades. If you're under dark enough skies, it's faintly visible to the naked eye, while being an easy target in binoculars or a telescope. The planet spans about 3.5 arc seconds in diameter. Visually, it appears as a small greenish-blue disk in a telescope. On the 15th, the 43% waxing crescent moon will be 2.5 degrees north of Uranus. By the end of February, the planet's appearance will not noticeably change, and Uranus will appear roughly in the same position between Jupiter and the Pleiades. On February 1st, magnitude 7.8 Neptune will be low in the southwest in Pisces as darkness falls, setting at just before 9 p.m. The planet's bluish disk appears a little more than two arc seconds across, so you'll need a telescope to see the disk of the planet. By the third week of February, Neptune too will get lost in the twilight glow until it reemerges in the morning skies in April. Going forward each month will let you know if the moon has any close passes with bright stars or DSOs, and will highlight a specific lunar feature to explore. On the morning of February 1st, the 65% waning gibbous moon will appear three-quarters of a degree north of first magnitude Spica, or Spica, in Virgo. On the 5th, you can spot the 25% illuminated waning crescent moon five degrees east of first magnitude Antares, low in the east before sunrise. On the 16th, the first quarter moon will be one and a half degrees east of the Pleiades, making for a gorgeous pairing, although the moon will wash the cluster out a bit. This month, let's explore the lunar feature Rupus recta, that's best seen when the moon is two days past first quarter and one day past last quarter. This feature is best seen at these times, as that's when its shadow is easiest to see. You see, Rupus recta is a rectilinear fault that is sometimes called a scarp. That means that it shows itself as a cliff that's about 900 feet tall and 67 miles long. It's located on the eastern bank of Mare Nubium. When the angle of the sun is right, we see the shadow of the cliff forming a dark line near the moon's terminator. It's a stunning feature to see. You can spot it with 50 millimeter binoculars, but it will look best in a telescope. I urge you to check it out. It is probably my favorite of all the lunar features to look at. Moving out of the solar system, we're going to explore some of the best objects to observe in two constellations that are well placed for observing on February evenings. As darkness falls on February evenings, the constellation Auriga, the charioteer, is high in the eastern sky. This constellation, which is easy to spot, features the magnitude zero star Capella, which marks one of the five points of the squashed pentagon shape that marks this constellation. 
Beta Aurigae, or Menkalanan, is located about 7 degrees east of Capella, making it very easy to spot. This magnitude 1.9 star is actually a double star, but you'll need a telescope under dark skies to try to spot its companion. The primary star is bright, glowing at magnitude 1.9, while the secondary star is much fainter, at magnitude 10.8. However, the secondary star is just over three arc minutes away from the primary, and under a dark sky, you should be able to spot it pretty easily. This system is located about 82 light years away from us. Auriga is home to several popular deep sky objects, including some open clusters and some very nice nebulae. Let's start with the open cluster M37, which is sometimes referred to as the salt and pepper cluster. As far as winter clusters go, M37 is my favorite open cluster to observe. It's bright, it's relatively dense, and it's easy to locate. The cluster is made up of more than 500 stars and shines at magnitude 5.6 while spanning about 24 arc minutes in size. From a dark sky site, you can spot M37 as a faint fuzzy patch with the naked eye, while in binoculars it appears as a mottled glow, a bit smaller than the full moon. In a telescope, this cluster really shines, as about a hundred of its stars can be resolved with a six-inch scope. The cluster itself is about 25 light years wide, and it's located about 4,500 light years away from us. Locating M37 is a breeze. Start at magnitude 2.6 Mahasam, which is 7.5 degrees due south of Menkalanan. From Mahasam, sweep 4.5 degrees south, then sweep 1.5 degrees west, and you'll spot the cluster. Our next object is the Pinwheel Cluster, cataloged as M36. While fainter than M37 at magnitude 6, this cluster is smaller and more compact than M37. The cluster spans about seven arc minutes in size, and it contains 178 stars, which are brighter than 14th magnitude. Ten of those stars are brighter than 10th magnitude, making them easy to resolve with a small scope or even large binoculars. The cluster is about 14 light years across, and it's located about 4,300 light years away from us. Finding M36 is also easy to do. Imagine a line from Mahasam to Elnath. Start at the middle of that line and sweep one and a half degrees northwest and you should spot the cluster. Next on our list is the starfish cluster, M38, a bit fainter at magnitude 6.4. This is still an easy and beautiful open cluster to spot. It spans about 20 arc minutes in size and is comprised of approximately 100 stars. The brightest stars seem to form an asterism in the shape of the Greek letter pi. That's why this is sometimes referred to as the Pi Cluster. It's located 3,480 light years away from us, and it's about 15 light years wide. In binoculars, the cluster will appear as a fuzzy glow, with several of the brighter members being resolved. In a telescope, dozens of the member stars will show themselves. Locating M38 is easy as well. Start at Mahasam and sweep 6 degrees west, then sweep one and a half degrees south, and you'll be looking right at the cluster. If open clusters aren't your thing, Auriga offers some nice nebulae to explore. The brightest of these is IC405, the Flaming Star Nebula. In long exposure images, this nebula looks a bit like a fire, burning with a bright star at its base. The brightest section of the nebula spans a little more than half a degree across and is listed at magnitude 6. The Flaming Star Nebula is located about 1,500 light years away from us. You can spot it from dark skies with binoculars, where it appears as a faint glow about the same size as the moon. I've seen this many times in my 8-inch daub, and it's pretty easy to spot. Finding it is pretty easy as well. From magnitude 2.6 Hasela, sweep 4 degrees east to a 4.5 magnitude star. Then sweep 1 degree north, and you'll see the nebula. After finding and observing the objects in Auriga, you can move a bit further south in the sky to the constellation Orion. Easy to locate with several bright stars, including bright red Betelgeuse, which represents Orion's shoulder, and bright white Rigel, 
representing the hunter's left foot. Located halfway between those two stars are three stars between magnitude 1.65 and 2.4 that run nearly east to west. These are the stars that make up Orion's belt. The easternmost star is magnitude 1.85 Alnitak. Next is Almalam, the brightest of the three, at magnitude 1.65, and the same distance to the west brings us to magnitude 2.4 Mentaka. About a third of the way from Alnitak to Rigel, you'll see what appears to be three stars running almost north to south. These represent the Sword of Orion, and the middle star in the sword is our first deep sky object that we'll explore in Orion this month. I'm referring to M42, the Orion Nebula. This is one of the brightest deep sky objects in the entire sky, and even from a moderately light polluted sky, you'll notice that the middle star in the sword appears hazy. This is M42. Under dark skies, the nebula is obvious to the naked eye, and in binoculars, you can make out lots of details within the nebula. Through a telescope, you'll want to use low power as the nebula is large. Under very dark skies with a larger telescope, many people begin to see faint color in the nebula. I've personally seen it through an 18-inch scope, and the pinkish hues were obvious. The bright core of the nebula is marked by four stars called the trapezium. This is the closest major star-forming region to us, at a distance of 1,344 light-years. The complex is about 24 light-years in diameter, and in our skies it glows at magnitude 4 and spans just over 1 degree across. Located about a quarter of a degree north of the trapezium is a comma-shaped area of nebulosity. This is M43, a separate object that is part of the Great Orion Nebula Complex. There are many other cataloged objects nearby to explore. Another popular one is NGC 1977, the Running Man Nebula, which is located half a degree north of M43. This nebula was discovered by Sir William Herschel in 1786, who was featured in our Great Astronomers series. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Anyway, the Running Man is about 40 by 25 arc minutes in size, but it's a bit fainter at magnitude 7. Dark skies or a nebula filter will help you spot it. Visually, it appears as a large diffuse glow with bright and dark areas. Long exposure images show the Running Man very clearly. Another fun object in Orion is the Reflection Nebula M78. Dark skies or a nebula filter will help you spot it as it's a bit fainter at magnitude 8.3 and spans 6 by 8 arc minutes in size. You can spot it with binoculars, but it's best seen in a telescope. Reflection nebulae are just that. They are clouds of mostly hydrogen gas that are reflecting the light from a nearby star. The Merope Nebula, associated with the Pleiades and Taurus, is the most famous example of a reflection nebula. M78 is illuminated by two stars, one that is 10th magnitude and the other is 11th magnitude. In a telescope, you should be able to spot a fan-shaped glow and a lane of dust that appears as a dark line. Located just a quarter of a degree north of M78, but part of the same complex of gas, is the Reflection Nebula NGC 2071. It's a bit fainter, coming in at magnitude 9.5, and spanning only 7 by 5 arc minutes. This complex is located about 1,600 light years away from us. Locating M78 is easy. Start at Mentaka and sweep east for 3.5 degrees and you'll spot M78. The last object on our tour this month is NGC 2175, which is really two objects in one. It's an open cluster that's surrounded by a large area of nebulosity known as the Monkey Head Nebula. As in photos, it actually looks a bit like a monkey's head. The complex is magnitude 6.8 and can be seen with binoculars, but it looks best in a telescope at low power. The cluster is 18 arc minutes wide, and the nebula is about 40 arc minutes across. Dark skies or a nebula filter will help you to spot the monkey head. To locate the monkey head, start at magnitude 2.85 Tehat in Gemini, and sweep west two degrees till you come to Propus, a magnitude 3.3 star. Then continue on that same line for one more degree. 
Now sweep south for 2 degrees and you'll be looking right at NGC 2175. I do hope that you'll go after these objects and that they become favorites of yours as well. Well, that's all for this month. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or a voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. You'll find other members, videos, blogs, and lots of other useful information there for your enjoyment. You can also visit our YouTube channel, the Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Please subscribe. Please consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform. It helps us to get new listeners. Thank you again for listening, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.